I guess everyone here because you are interested in having some type of program that helps make what you're doing more accessible and equitable so you can embrace your full community. That's true? Yes. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll see what, uh, I've done this for now 23 years um, and uh, had programs in multiple co-ops, multiple cities. Uh, learned some things that work, some that don't. I'm going to say what I'm going to tell you today is a gospel, but I will tell you that um, I'm a big believer that things that uh, come from real world experience are often uh, much more powerful lessons and offer wisdom than stuff on a drawing board that we think what might work uh, it does not offer. So uh, you can take this and, and hopefully make something that's really awesome and it's better than anything that my teams have done and then we'll steal what you've done. Well, no, it's called Extreme P6 and it's not okay. stealing. <laughs> we will totally be happy to rip you all a flavor. So who am I? Well, uh, See here, it's one of the things about up and coming. Normally, I'm at a co-op conference. I know everybody because I've been in co-ops for, for so long. Uh, this is a chance to get to know new people, so it's great. And the General Manager Chicago Market, which is a startup in Uptown Chicago, please stop by. Let us know you're coming in. We'll be happy to give you a grand tour. If you come in on Wednesdays, we have a farmers market. You can see our site. We can talk shop. You can, you know, we can just, you know, commiserate and find out if uh, what we can learn from each other. Please do stop by. I'm also the treasurer of Fair Trade America, which is, you know, the national uh, federation that represents Fair Trade International, and I am the voting delegate this year for the United States. So I got to go to Nairobi in about three weeks and hang out with some cooperators there, There's wonderful people in Fair Trade Africa, and some uh, folks co-ops growing tea and coffee. I'm going to be working with, see what we can do to help people in Global South get get better market here. But anyway, that sense of equity and, and shared prosperity is very important to me, and this is why I like these programs. So that's the same for you. I'm going to keep, since I know we've got a mixed crowd, don't know what people's experience level, where they're coming in, I'm sitting back and maybe a little bit of a Aristotelian inspiration today, right? Oh, there's one other thing I'm going to say. I'm going to hold questions to the end, so I'll get my little poker. So in case you missed anything, yes, I am general manager at Chicago Market, uh, and uh, that's all you need to know for right now, except for that I've had 23 years of dealing with programs like this, and um, I've learned a few things I'm going to try to pass on whatever wisdom you can glean from what I have to say. We are going to keep a framework here, just try to answer some core questions and, and see how we extend off of those, because again, we may be approaching this from different ways, but I figured just running off a list of things we've done and, and whatnot, that might, might run off, but uh, trying to give you something to grab onto. So we're going to answer these. Who, what, when, where, why, and maybe a couple other things we answer. But we're going to keep it old school Aristotle style. So, why? The big why. This is the most powerful of these questions, and it's the most important, because if you don't know why you're doing it, that's a problem, right? So I, I'm guessing you have some whys, and I, like I say, I'm going to hold questions to the end from you, but not from me. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. How many people in here want to do something like this because it ties back to your cooperative identity? Is there anybody that thinks that is important? I got some of these. Does so anybody want to tell me a little bit about what the co-op identity is? You can. Uh, there's a statement on a cooperative identity, and I think it's important as board members or managers to get familiar with that. I remember once I was sitting with a um, head of the economics department from Havana, we were sitting down in, in Cuba, and I was with the International Cooperative Alliance Executive Director. And the guy says, so we're trying to do co-ops, and we want to deeply understand co-ops because we have a shared identity, right? And I said, Jason, tell everyone what it is. And the ICA director was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and he didn't know. I thought, I thought, that's something you should have in you. So get familiar with that. Get familiar with that and, and see how all the programs you have really should, should tie back to that, in my opinion. I think that when, when, we're, when we're operating like a co-op, that's a space we can be transformative, we can win. When we're looking like something else, it's a space we're not in. Um, I probably should just go ahead and say, a, a cooperative is an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise. So if you get that inside of you, you're going to be a few steps ahead of everybody else. It's important. It's, it's a shame I probably could find about half a percent of the managers in the country that really could tell you about that. And how are you going to evoke that in your work if it's not in here? That's just my opinion, but I think it's an important thing, and it's absolutely true when you look at that. You say those 
economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations, making sure there is a sense of equity and shared co-creation of value and that you embrace your full community, it's hard to argue that that's not in alignment. I would say if you don't make efforts to bring everybody in, regardless of their uh, economic conditions, you are failing in, in that. Okay, mission. Anybody have a mission that speaks to this? Want to share anything about it? Yeah, no, I thought I heard one. I, I would say it, it should be somewhere in, in some written culture in your co-op, these kind of ideas, and it's good to talk about them, but if they're not in writing, they're not real. Um, another why, maybe ends, I mean, maybe use policy governance. If your ends aren't somehow giving you a sense that this is something that's included, revisit them. Revisit them because this is this is direction your manager is going to take very seriously in the future, uh, and, and those need to be crafted in such a way that they they indicate that your full community is important to you as a food co-op. And of course, that's all governing core documents. I would say there's a, another piece. It's a business opportunity. And you say, oh, I knew he was a capitalist at heart, right? Here's the thing. Co-ops are businesses. We know that. They engage markets. It's a different way to engage markets and in a better way. I would say to you that as a business, because we talked about that association, but there's also enterprise. That word is important, too. There's a lot of people that are not going to be coming to your store if you don't make it reasonable for them to do so when they evaluate the value that they can bring to their family. You know, if you're on limited income, you have different choices. I know. I can recall having that situation when I was young. And yes, we had food stamps and WIC, and I remember that. So maybe I stigmatized myself. I don't care. I know what it was like. And so um, people are not going to say this high price co op is for me. Uh, if they don't have some way to soften that barrier. Um, the way, why is that important? Uh, when you bring people in to your co-op, your association is stronger, you're going to be more reflective of your community, you're going to be more representative of your community. That gives more collective intelligence. But it's also true that you will have higher sales. And that's important. So why are we giving market away that we could have while doing good? Remember Chuck Snyder, we've probably heard of him from National Co-op Bank, he used to say, it was like, uh, do good, do, do well to do good. I'd say you can also do good to do well. So it's like we don't, it's not wrong to see that there is some type of uh, economic opportunity for the co-op as well. Reciprocal economics is what we're about, so it's not, we're not a charity, we're not a profit maximizer, but we are a place where reciprocal economics works, this can work with that. You say the who, the first who is who's going to do this. I'll say something that may feel a little controversial, but I think the Reality is a bulk of a lot of the design and, and execution is going to fall on your management properly. Because this is also going to tie back to so many other things that are relevant to operations. You want that person to lead their team in, in development of this. It doesn't mean that you just hand it off and say go, go forth and, and do. You want to be involved, want to be in the conversation. But ultimately, a lot of that technical work I think is properly there because it's going to integrate with other strategic priorities and there's going to be a lot of detail that a seasoned manager particularly will understand how that you're going to be engaging your own market and your own other programs. So we don't want to just say, here's this thing, then try to figure out how to shoehorn it in. I've got to just be cautious of that. But at the same time, who is it that can say this is something that, that we really expect? Well, that's a governing issue. <laughs> You know, and, and I think there's a, there, there may be an advising and consent role as well, but I, I would say this is a word of caution. Uh, you don't want to say, here we've got the entire thing planned out, you just go do. I would just be careful because there may be some unintended consequences. Anyway, now as far as who we're trying to benefit and include, first thing is do you have criteria? Sometimes uh, people say we, we just want to help this population. Well, who is it? Um, at co-ops that I have uh, led, we, we, we've oftentimes uh, tried to distill like what are food issues because that's what we are our grocery store. So uh, we focus on if you qualify for a food assistance program, you qualify for this. I'm not saying you have to do that. Sometimes people are worried about are we stigmatizing people having them mention this. But I think th these are kind of questions where at some point um, it's 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 kind of an unavoidable question and. I'll just say that I've never had an issue having presented some criteria and have people go ahead and, 
and, and say whether they qualify, whether or not you want them to produce something to validate that. That's a different step. Some people, yes or no. I haven't found that there's been large, when, when I haven't had a, a, a requisite um, informational uh, kind of submission, haven't seen a large scale kind of uh, game in the system or anything like that. So I think in, in some ways uh, it's okay to have uh, an honor system in my opinion, as long as you have clear criteria and you say, you understand what these are, is this you? I think you can, you can do okay with that. But that's up to you. It depends on the amount of risk you want to expose yourself to. It depends on the style of, of co-op you have. But you should have some criteria about who qualifies. It's not something like, if they say, do you want cheaper groceries? Everybody's like, sure. <laughs> so there should be some criteria, because we, we, we don't have infinite resources, and we want to make sure that those resources are directed to the people that, that really stand to benefit, that are, that, that are going to be left behind otherwise, or where there's, there's real impact. Because, and frankly, uh, like myself, I don't need the program. Well, it would be wrong for me to deplete the asset base just to just to try to do something that it's to my advantage, but it's not something that's really a justice issue. I'm all, I'm okay, right? Um, but you need to define those criteria, and I would co-create that with your management. Why do you have them? Again, if you have looser criteria, you may say, well, we want to include people. Maybe they're not on food assistance program. Maybe it's just uh, people who say, I just lost my job or I'm in school or something. You can have broader reach with your program, but you also inflate the cost and you will end up, this is the caution, you end up having more people in your pool who are already shopping with you and not really uh, uh, subject, you know, to the same kind of uh, vulnerabilities that, that you start out with trying to address. So I just be careful about just layering on everything. So I've seen people, well, what about military veterans? What about, I think when you get away from focus, it creates more problems. We're really talking about, in my opinion, people who really have hard choices to make about how to feed their family and you can give them a chance to at least have a playing field where they've, they've got a real choice. If it's just like we're trying to include people because it seems nice or a marketing rub, I think we're in the wrong zone myself. In practice, uh, I've always kept things tight. Uh, some places I've seen that have not don't get a good economic result, and I think that's a, a problem because, you know, maybe I would rather see the program be a little more aggressive to people who really need it than just trying to include everybody we can put on the list. That's me. It's a practitioner's guide, though, so I can say what I like. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where do we do it? That may seem like a weird question. You're like, well, in our store, right? Well. Okay, let's think about that. Yeah, your, your local store, absolutely. There's no question that is a place, but there's other considerations. Are you gonna have online delivery and order? Is it valid there? There are technical barriers that will happen there. Like how does that interface the system if you're using Instacart or something else? So that's something where this is another reason a manager needs to be involved in this. If you wanna extend that space, that could be a way to make a more powerful program, but also complicated. And uh, in, in the past, I have, um, uh, work with my teams and, and determined that it wasn't in our interest at the time. At the level the technology was working, it really wasn't a good cost benefit for the program. But maybe things have changed, but that's a consideration you're going to need to have, and especially as this is becoming a much bigger piece of the grocery industry, right? Make sure I'm on time, Jay. Uh, department specifics. Oh, where in the store is it valid? Do you have, uh, you sell whiskey? You want to give people a community discount on whiskey? Maybe you do. I like whiskey, but uh, in the past I've also said uh, with teams, we've talked it through, talked through the board, we've excluded alcohol purses from these programs because they didn't seem to really be on mission with what we were trying to do. Not that we want to say some people don't deserve to also enjoy some of these fine things. Whiskey may be the ultimate culinary expression humans have yet achieved, <laughs> but it is not necessarily the mission we are trying to serve. Yeah. Um, sometimes you might have a subcontractor, like maybe you have a sushi bar or something, let's say. Is it something that extends to that? Because the economics of that are a little different. These are just things where I'm not saying that there's necessarily one right answer. There are some certainly wrong answers, but there, there are different ways you can approach it. And you need to look at the specifics, have your management really give you a reason to believe something that's that kind of divergence from just your core business makes sense. Because you can get in a lot of trouble being too expansive with this stuff. And it can also create cognitive dissonance. If it's like discount beer, 
there are real questions that come up from that. Okay. Um, classes. Does this extend, if you're on this program, does it extend to classes? What if you have a, a third party that's doing the class? Uh, do they want to participate? Do you eat it? How does that work? It's another kind of space. If you have an education space or you're doing stuff off-site, um, also maybe you're showing up at uh, an art fair or a farmer's market, you got to stand. Is it available there? How do you want to track that event? Is it a, they're just questions about what you want to do. I'm not saying you shouldn't. It's just there's, there's things that become more complex and so it, it's, 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 it's something you need to address up front because people are going to ask you, does this work? You should have an answer. I'm not saying I'm going to tell you the answer. In my background as a practitioner, it's yes to the first one, no to the second for online. Uh, classes actually was a yes. We figured out ways to do that for anything that was uh, specific to like our nutrition programs or things. A lot of those were free anyway for folks, you know. But uh, we would try to find a way to subsidize that. Uh, and and off-site events was a no because we didn't really have a way to deal with it. And that was not something, again, that seemed on mission. You know, it didn't make a lot of sense to us. So there's a layer of complexity we just shed. And I'll be the same for you. And department specifics, I excluded subcontracts with the team and excluded alcohol. But most other purposes were, were valid, right? Didn't matter. Like unlike SNAP, where you may say you can't get a hot sandwich and use a SNAP or you know, some type of supplemental nutrition program, right? Well, for us, for our program, yeah, I mean, if people want a sandwich, good. <laughs> Not a problem for me. All right, what we're going to do, well, it's, it's, it's gotta be some type of economic advantage for people who have economic disadvantage. That's pretty clear. It's what we want. So a couple of things are gonna happen here. There's some folks who think we should just give the food away because if people need it. I mean, that's an instinct, and I understand that. You're not a food bank. Remember your cooperative identity statement. This is a hard one to swallow sometimes, but you're an association and an enterprise, and it's not that you do this entrepreneurial stuff over here so you can do this associational stuff over here. As a, as a practitioner, as someone who's served as a graduate professor on co-op business and studied all over the place, one thing I see that's very highly associated with co-ops that are powerfully producing results for their members in their community is this, this synthesis when your entrepreneurial activity is feeding the associate activity. They're the same thing, you know, when you're, you're doing this. And I don't think uh, acting as a charity does that, and I don't think when you're just trying to make as much money as you can, it does that. There's a, there's a different way to do things when, remember what Chuck said, you know, do well to do good. There's that space where you're doing both simultaneously. That's when the answer is generally yes. Anytime a program has that quality, I'll generally approve it pretty quickly because I know that's, that's the zone. That's when you're in the zone. But anyway, higher level discounts, yes, you can have more potential impact. If I gave someone 50% off of groceries, they would say, wow, that made a huge difference. But I don't think it's sustainable to do that, even though this is a small population. And this is not, again, it's a charity. There's where when people can't participate at a certain level with you, that's where you probably should be linking with other institutions that, that are in the business of that. How can we take some of our food and get it into the food pantries and the shelters. That's a place for that, but giveaways isn't it, because um, you can't deal with the cost. Lower levels of discounts. Some of those people want to say, what if it was just 5% and we start with that. There are things who are, where, where you're not going to make a difference in people's shopping behavior. You're not going to, in, in, in essence, you are not helping anyone. Even if a program exists, doesn't mean people will use it, and that's a problem. So there's, there's a, a kind of a general rule that I have that I think as a, as a practitioner it, it, it works when I apply something to a pro forma, when I look at a plan, uh, just even just think about rationally, is margin minus labor. That, that tells you the upper limit of what you should probably do. If you're exceeding that, I think it's a problem. If your margin minus labor is 15 and you want to give 20 away, I think you are outside of what your organization can healthfully uh, sustain. Okay, because you know, you, that margin minus labor is what you pay for everything other than your people and your product with. It pays your rent, it pays your electricity, et cetera. When you're eating into that, now, it is, now you are subsidizing in, in a different way. You're not giving a discount, you are paying for the food. And again, to me, that goes outside of the scope of where the co-op space is, because we are not a charity. That's why I, I picked that, because every time I'm modeled out higher, uh, it ends up deteriorating the asset base of the co-op at some level. And that's a, that's a bridge I don't think you should cross. I won't, uh, but it, maybe you will, and 
you can prove me wrong, but nobody has yet. The folks that have gone more aggressive, uh, every time I look at the financials, it looks like it is, it's bleeding them a little bit. I, I don't think that's good. That's me, so that's a good, and it like, tells you like an upper, there may be a lower limit, like what will make a difference. Should be like the lower limit, and margin my slavery to me is the upper limit. As a practitioner, that's what I look at. All right, mind the gap, what's the gap? not the L train gap, but um, what I'm talking about here is there's this conventional food system. And as you know, it's propped up by pushing a lot of things into externalities and, and all this. And, and so the, there'll be a cheaper cost uh, on the shelf for something that's probably more expensive to society as a whole, but we won't get into that debate. But I'll just say you're in markets where these folks are trying to feed their families and sometimes your price, local, natural, organic, biodynamic, you know, made under the moonlight with a drum circle, whatever it is, there's a cost. And, and that is a cost difference. And, and if somebody's looking, it's like, I can't afford this difference. That's the difference in my children having, feeling full and just barely getting by. So if you can close that gap, people have a real choice. It's not just, oh, I could buy your stuff cheaper. It's now when I'm looking at all the options I have, this is at least within range where it's not crazy for me to consider this as a viable option. That's the gap. So I believe within those boundaries I'm talking about, the zone you wanna be in is a place where a person can, can, can rationalize and justify a decision to choose you where they say, I am not depriving my family for the sake of trying to push a better ideal or I'm not like, I really wanna support organic, but we're gonna to have to you know, and not have enough caloric intake in our family in order to support that. You don't want that. So if you can get that gap close enough, then people are empowered to make a choice, and that's important. That plays back to that co-op identity too, a couple of rows. Self-help, self-responsibility. You're giving people an opportunity to actually activate that. That's important. So that's the gap. When, oh, this is, there's a lot of wins here. Um, the first thing I'd say is, the wind applies, when is this going to actually work? Is it an everyday discount? Now, I, I, uh, in um, the Northwest, at a cooperative that we, people didn't have these kind of programs. So we're like, can we do this? We didn't know what the implications were gonna be. So I said, well, here's something I know will model out. Let's start there. And we just said, let's just do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. You know, so we just wanted to start out with something. Uh, you may have specific site characteristics ultimately where uh, I don't know, there's sometimes calls have uh, different markets, like it's like a resort town, and Saturday and Sunday it's just cramped, so you might say, look, we've got to figure out if we're going to bring in all these new people, maybe we try to incentivize Monday through Friday. I'm not saying you should, I think there's, there's real equity issues that people have in choice, I'm just saying, this is something you need to decide. Is this an everyday discount? Is it some days or sometimes? Is it all the hours you have or not? My personal instinct is at this point, I think the data shows almost every cop should have this as just a standing thing. Whenever you show up, it works. But I know that some co-ops have really different characteristics at times, so that's just a question you should answer. Probably say yes, all of it. Um, duration, what do I mean by that one? So if someone signs up for the program, is it now you're on it forever? And people's circumstances change. So I think that's an issue too, just like once you sign up, it's in perpetuity till you come in. I don't think that's a good system. You may end up with a lot of folks that are getting discounts well past the point of need. And so you don't want something that's encumbering or uh, that, that, that undermines anyone's dignity, but you should have some kind, of, some kind of limitation for how long it lasts and someone could come in and re-up because sometimes you're in persistent poverty. It's not always easy. The system doesn't always make it easy for everybody to get out of that cycle. But at least it's, maybe it's six months, maybe it's a year, but figure out a time where it's like, this is how long this runs and just come back and go to the service desk and fill out this paperwork, verifying that this is something you still believe you need. Okay, but I, I, I would just caution you about something that doesn't have some termination point built in to at least revalidate that because you'll end up with a lot of folks in mean, there. Not many people are like, you know what I need to do is go tell them to take a discount off. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So anyway, that's, that's what I mean by duration. Make, make sure you've got to define duration. Your manager may suggest some things, that's good. But if they don't, say, why do we not have some type of set time frame here? And they should be able to answer that. And the odds are they'll say, oh, well, I forgot to do it. 
and then it gets done. Frequency. Is this something that you have uh, a shopping trip a week? Is it something every time you buy something you can do? Um, it's just something you need to define. <coughs> I think that the 99.9% .9 answer is just, it's just active when you come in the store, but it's, a, it's still a question that needs answered, right? Because this program's gonna have to be written out. I think uh, people should be able to shop as much as they want. I like the sales for one, that's great. Uh, and, 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 and oftentimes, uh, one of the things you can get into problem is if you have restrictive stuff, just know that the people you're serving in this kind of a situation don't have usually a big wad of cash to go say, I'm gonna make one big trip. They're gonna need, you know, sometimes to come in more frequently and, and maybe live paycheck to paycheck. So uh, if you limit frequency, that may, be a, that may be a real issue for people. So I would caution you about trying to contain costs by doing that because it might disproportionately harm those folks in a way that's the exact opposite of what you're trying to achieve. But this question, again, this is just questions you should answer. I'm not answering for you, I'll tell you what I did. Um, and when do you do it? Now, I'm suggesting launch. I think you should launch with this program, myself. But I'm not on your board and I'm not your manager. But I, I will tell you why. For one, it gives me an opportunity to actually, for once, put some little graphic in here that's really cool. Okay. Um, I'm not very, you know, I'm not a presenter builder, so you don't get a whole lot of that, so feel fortunate you got one. Um, but I think when you when you do something at launch, it's important because of this first one, or second, third one, is your brand. And, and your brand that you come out of the gate with is going to stick to a good degree. It is awfully hard to change that first impression. Well, they say there's never a second chance to make a first impression. I think this is true. And so if you launch underwhelmingly, that's what people are going to think. Well, that co-op, I don't know, it's okay. Or I went in, I couldn't afford anything, I got other stuff to do. <laughs> well, folks are going to come back and wait, like, did they, do they have it now? They're not going to do that. They're going to go ahead and decide very quickly whether or not you're a place that includes them, that is welcome to them, that cares about what their, their interests are. And if you don't show that day one, I think you will have a hard time later. So this is my spiel on this. If it's like we're not sure about it, figure out something you are sure about. And that may mean back and if you want to go 15%, maybe you launch at 10 you can get by with raising it. That's going to get general acclaim, and, and it gives you a little bit of room in case you, yeah, your numbers are working a little funny. But launching with nothing, I think, is a huge mistake, and, and, and there's enough co-ops, enough experience that I think there's not a good reason not to have something to launch. Obviously, figure that out. Bonus. See, I'm, I'm going through because I want questions. <laughs> How do you pay for it? That's the real thing, because this is a cause. Nothing is free. It, just, it, it doesn't this. So there's a couple. Now, when you're early on, before you're actually making money, oftentimes you can actually deal with these kind of things through granting and stuff like that so you can get people to help subsidize this. Now, as you are profitable and later on in your draw, some of these opportunities are uh, no longer uh, available to you, but early on uh, you, you certainly can do that. There was a, a, a consulting client I talked through uh, uh, one of these programs and, and they had uh, good access to one of these kind of programs and like for a certain window it will work see if that's right for you uh, donations can work sometimes with uh, uh, there are folks who will put that as one of their let's say you do a roundup at the registry you know it's like when you just come in it's like oh I've got 50 cents on here I can put that in the program sometimes you can use something like that again just those kind of situations may not always be available to you, uh, but during the early part when you are undoubtedly going to have negative net income for a few years, that's just the nature of the beast, you have opportunities to do things, and then even later on you can find ways to funnel to ancillary programs so you don't give up on that. Operational changes, okay? The, the, there are the things your manager is going to know, hopefully, <laughs> that, that it can be done to, to mitigate the costs, uh, to generate value out of these things uh, that, that help pay for it. So one of the things I would say, it kind of plays the next one. So you could just say we eat it, but I don't think that's necessarily good. If you promote these things the right way, you've drawn enough new people, you have incremental gains in volume. So there's people, like I said earlier, who will not shop with you. Sometimes we just have a program, we don't tell anybody about it or it's underwhelming. We'll just basically give away certain things with nothing coming back. That's good, so we've helped somebody, but again, Co-ops are rooted in reciprocal economics. 
So I want to say if I'm giving, you know, I also want to make sure that there's a sustainable economic engine because we're a business. Now, if I can bring in enough people, let's say we had sales of 10 million, and we can get a program like this, and maybe we're giving away 15%, but that gets us like 10 and a half million, and, and almost all that half million is new. Say that it's kind of matched. <coughs> we're getting enough, it's not going to say, um, going back to margin minus labor, it's not enough that that's going to move the needle on labor. I went from 10 to 10 and a half million. My labor's probably going to move by zero. That's not a problem. So really what I'm looking at is sales minus cost of goods. What's left? And, and if, if we're running margins in 35, 40, take 15% off, that's fine. They're actually adding value to the company. And they wouldn't have been shopping there. So now all of a sudden I'm like, okay, that's, that's very sustainable. But actually, my balance sheet and my income statements can start to look better. So if, if you can bring in new market, to me, that's the best way to pay for it because people are paying for it themselves. They're getting economic value, they're getting an opportunity, and, and they're covering their costs. They're, they're covering their take on it. So that's a good thing. Um, so that's, that's what I would say to you in terms of how you pay for it. Um, hopefully, you figure out a number that's enticing enough, and manager can do this, to get just enough incremental sales gain that it, it, it offsets the costs mostly or entirely. That is possible. Um, so that's the good news. <laughs> Here's another little bonus. How's it synergize with other programming? So one of the things about this is it is not a panacea. If I'm doing a food for all or community discount program, whatever you want to call it, you may come up with some marketing pizzazz specific to yourself. Um, it, it should be part of a broader program I mean, a lot of us are looking at diversity, equity, inclusion, and some of that includes this idea of socioeconomics too, yeah? And, and, and one program is not going to be a fix. People have different circumstances, different opportunities. So I would say, let's, let's look at this in context. A bunch of things you can do. First, I don't know, hopefully NCG is not mad. <laughs> I use a little logo there. But, you know, I helped build the program back in the day, so tough. Um, anyway. <laughs> So a basics program, and that's available to people even if they don't sign up for anything. So are you going to have some items that are essential pantry fill uh, that uh, have twin benefit? And this is the beauty of this. It has that double purpose kind of thing. So you, you can get something like a gallon of milk to someone at, at a rate that's affordable. Every day on the shelf, it means you're selling it close to wholesale. You're not making much of anything on it. Um, but it also helps your price image, which is going to be a problem if you're a natural food cook, just by the nature of you're selling things that don't externalize all their costs and you still have to make your books work, right? So something like a basics program helps anyone to come in and fill a shopping basket or find everyday values on core items. Now, I wouldn't say like basics, caviar, steaks. I mean, you, you know, be mindful this program actually has some integrity when you deploy it. But one of the great things with, uh, if you do uh, are eligible and you do join National Corp Grocers is they do a lot to source things out and get those low costs to you in, 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 in a programmatic way by leveraging the scale of all the co-ops in the country that are, that are participating. Otherwise, you're kind of on your own and you may have to eat some costs. Either way, it's still smart. Um, back before NCG leveraged anything, I mean, that's one of the things uh, my co-op in the Northwest did. You know, uh, we had a little program, but I said, let's reinvent it. So, that was actually one of the four or five around the country that ended up modeling that program. But um, we just, we did eat the cost on that. But it was so impactful to our brand image, it was worth it. Because everybody thought, well, that place is way overpriced. And that program did a lot to take uh, the starch out of that. And it worked and it helped bring people in. So that's the first thing. If you don't plan on some kind of basis program, you don't have to say, well, we're not NCT, you can't have it. Yeah, you can, we did. We were basics before basics were cool. Maybe, it's, maybe it was cooler because nobody else was doing it too much. But either way, this is something you should do. Membership accessibility. And this is uh, another piece of this. We talked about who earlier. Is your program going to be specific to members who also have some kind of a need demonstrated? Or is it going to be anyone that demonstrates a need can get on your program? That's a core question. And that will have impact on just how much cost you get in. And, and it also um, has implications for how, you know, the membership ownership is viewed by your broader group, right? Um, 
I'm, I've, I've had that both ways in co-ops. I have managed with 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 folks, and I, I would say that um, in one case we were just adamant that if people have a need, we're just going to fill it, and that that's it. And the other case, we thought uh, this really should be something that helps grow membership because one of the things it'll do is it'll take a whole class of people and completely disincentivize any kind of idea of joining because I'm getting a certain benefit and it's like it now all of a sudden there's a whole voice not at the table when we have an election so it's like it's counter what we're doing. This is a really deep consideration and something the board should be very, very much heavily involved in by the way. It's a member issue. Uh, so you, you should be collaborating with your management and, and try to sort this out. Um, my my current as, a, it's, as having dealt with both ways, my current understanding and the way I, I think is important is is actually to have the membership as a piece, but to make sure that the membership itself is doesn't have such a barrier that it's like now I've created something that people can't use, right? So one of the things we're working on with Chicago Market is this sense of a grant pathway to ownership, and we already have. Uh, one person put in a $10,000 donation already, like I'm going to subsidize some of these. So we're figuring out ways to help people get in, because we've got uh, accessible you know, programs, that's, uh, all are welcome is what we call it, where you have a very, very low payment. So, except in the most extreme cases, people can join the co-op. So this, they'll be able to access programs like this too. But there are people who really don't have anything to spare. And so we're trying to figure out a pathway for that. So if you are going to restrict it to membership, I think that's, that's a net positive for your associational health in the long run. It is. When you're asking something of people, and I know that's a little bit uncomfortable, but I do think uh, just in practice, it, it changed the way that there was representation and representational voices in the dialogue. And I think ultimately that's important. It's a, otherwise, you've got one class of people that all controls and the, the co-op, and you've got another class that's heavily involved, but they're cut out. Um, and since we don't want to just, you know, make membership mean nothing, you've got to have some kind of program. So if you don't have um, some kind of pathways, I, I will be working on that because I think it, it works hand in hand with this kind of uh, community discount food for all program. Otherwise, um, you, you're, you're picking two, I think, less helpful choices that are less balanced with that identity we started with. Nutrition and cooking classes, oh, it's kind of a, seems like a non sequitur. But, and we heard this in one of the sessions, uh, I was glad someone brought it up, this idea that some people are coming from where they're not even used to fresh foods, so their own food co-op, and they think Doritos is food because our system has not provided the kind of opportunity, the kind of environment where some people, especially the ones that are most in need of these kind of programs, they're not sure what to do with what you got in there. And they see quinoa, they're like, the hell will I do with this? So, you know, it, it, there's some folks, even some of the lands, I see it's like they've not developed cooking skills. I don't know what's going on with that. So do you have programs, whether it's, it doesn't have to be class, it can be materials you have. There's some kind of support. Maybe you're linking with other organizations in the community. How do you help people to access the knowledge that comes from all these different food traditions that are out there available? So they're more likely to be interested in these things and benefit from them. Again, if you just have a program, you say, it's a discount, mission accomplished. People can afford the food. There's a functional aspect of also, um, do people out there that could get this discount have uh, a, a pathway to draw the most value out of them? They won't unless you have access to all that wealth of information that's in your community. There's people all over the place with cooking skills, recipes. I mean, everything from like, uh, one, of the, one of the things uh, I want to do with Chicago markets, like a, in the summer we have kids camp. I've done these before where you know, we just, it's like kids have summer camp, wherever they'll come in, you know, a few hours every day and we'll have things to teach them all kinds of cooking skills, get them to the point where they can make things themselves, get relationships with food, understand where the food's coming from a different way. That matters. You can do the same thing, and have done this with, uh, with other groups of subsidized programs where there were just a, a series people could participate. Sometimes it was folks that were dealing with uh, shelters of various kinds and come in and invest in these kind of cooking skills and we get professional training, you have fun, you get some free food, we'll give them some vouchers and stuff to go in the store and then they can say, oh, and I also want to sign up for these programs and I know what to do with them. And that was massively successful. 
So I just say it seems like a bolt on, but it's not really. There's there's a whole other piece about helping people understand why they want to do it. Networking with food pantry, social service, and youth focused nonprofits. Why? Is because if you do this great thing and no one knows about it, and the people you're targeting with it um, don't know about it, they're not going to use it. So there are folks who can help get the word out, and you should say. Who are folks that link with the people we're trying to reach and, and work with them? They're going to be very happy someone is actually thinking about them and thinking about the, 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 the principles for which they're aging. So I would, I would reach out. Those people, those community organizers, community groups, church groups, you know, be active. It's co-ops are, well, they say, we all say we're not very good about tooting our own horn. It's just, you know, just blare on the thing, you know. <laughs> This is something good that we're trying to do here. And also reach out to those folks as you're developing a program, have your manager do it, whatever. Just try to hear what, what's their take on it. Is, what, is the direction we're going to make any sense? Is it going to matter? What, how should we message it as we're getting out there? So this, the folks that, that are going to be the end users will have insights you do not. They have insights I do not, so I have to ask a lot of questions a lot of times. Uh, join NCG, and you say, I'm not, NCG is not paying me, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying that it's very difficult to get the pricing you need to fuel some of these things on your own, especially if you're going to be small. And if you have a pathway to join, whether it's NCG or some other type of institution, there's, there is strength in numbers. And, and, and in a world where many of these businesses are consolidating and whatnot, I think it's, it's, it's a point where nothing's perfect, NCG's not perfect, I've been on the board of NCG, I'm a, I'm a proponent of it, but I would just say, yeah, it's imperfect. And it's, it's, it, it, as soon as it, if it became perfect, the world will change and we'll say, oh, it's not cutting it anymore or whatever, we've got to change it. This is a constant play. But if you don't have the backing of something, it's going to be hard to be accessible. And then it's like, well, we're selling the stuff, you know, maybe in a community without resources and we're higher priced than every other option in town. That goes over like a lead balloon. It's like, so I think it's very important to try to seek out any kind of pathway you can get to get that advantage. And, and a purchasing co-op is, is, a, is a powerful way to do that, and it's been time-tested across many industries. So again, I am not stumped with them. I'm just saying as a practitioner, I, I know it's important for us to say we, we need to also be able to leverage the strength of others because we're not going to have that much. Chicago market would be a pretty good size startup. For a startup world, it would be big. And in the, in, the, in the world of trying to leverage distributors, you know, they don't care. I mean, we're not going to get a great deal, so we're going to have to have some other folks that we really want to get the most potency out of what we're doing. Also, SNAP, uh, WIC, for us, link management, your programs may be different in different states, and they come by different names. Find ways to participate, you know. Make sure that the programs that are available that aren't you are things that you can execute effectively and in a dignified manner, that you've got all this stuff thought through about how people use it in your store. If there is some kind of a match, like we have link match, where we can get you know, a, a certain amount of uh, produce, it's almost like doubling your money, which makes it go further. We use this at our farmer's market. Again, if you stop by 2.30 to 7 on Wednesdays up until November, you can see it in action. Um, that should be part of your program. Sometimes I've, I've, I've seen food costs with access to those things that did not deploy it. Now, I don't understand that. It's like you can jump all over that. Uh, these, these things synergize with your other program. It makes it even more powerful because they're not usually exclusive. Now, there's another piece of this that I want to be careful because I, I skipped it earlier, and we'll circle back to it. How does this work as, as a practitioner? What's my biggest fear? It is that we have not thought through how it interfaces with all these other programs. Co-ops love programs, and some of them are really cool. I like programs. But if someone says, wow, there's a member discount. I'm a member. I want that discount today, and I also have this food for all discount. And then there's also this, all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute. That is not going to work. I walked in one co-op that had allowed intense stack, because they had no rule on stacking discounts. I thought, and so how's that working? We're not sure. It doesn't seem. It seems like our, our earnings are low. Now look, and I found customers that had a negative net margin. They'd stacked enough that they actually were like paying all, right at the zero. <laughs> I'm like, that is not the path. <laughs> so that needs to be thought through because you're going to end up with things that are member specific. So if you require membership, what happens? It, does it does it not kick in until it's like higher than what they normally get, and you get the difference, and, and then you participate? 
Is it something you stack? Because that maybe supercharges people's enthusiasm. There's, there's not a right answer here, but the wrong answer is just saying it'll sort itself out. It will not. You need to really be able to forecast, understand how these things do, and, add, and, and understand that if you don't have certain boundaries up front, they're harder to put in later. It's like, let's see how it goes. Pick the more conservative position. Have less stacking and less interface early. You can, it'll be much easier to add later if you know it's safe. Because, uh, again, these things have, have implications to you, right? And so you're, you're going to have a lot of these things. How do they work? Like sales? Yeah, I always let sales go through. But member-specific stuff, you got to be really careful. If it's like a special order case discount of 10%, do you now get 20%? I don't know. That's a, you know, it's pretty hefty. I know that's one of the things right now is people struggling with competition. Some of us are throwing pretty sizable discounts. I'm, as a practitioner, I have found that uh, throwing wild discounts out uh, across really broad, whole store, broad departments can be a pathway to ruin. It may feel a little good. It's like you get this pure victory. I was a little off topic, but I'm going to go here anyway. So we're at 30% off. Well, so I'm like, how's that work? <laughs> we are a store, and, and there's a point where if you, if you understand the economics of a store, remember this, if, if nothing else. I know it's even worse right now, but in general, historically, I would go through with staff and do this exercise. But, have them analyze real co-op business stuff. And they kind of like, so if you're doing well, they, they, they would come in and say, yeah, how much do you get out of every dollar you sell? What's left? 25 cents, 10 cents, they're all over the board. It's one. Not a lot of margin of error when you get one penny of every dollar. It's like, oh, we've got millions of sales. Well, that doesn't mean you've got millions of profits to just dole out. You know, you, you, can, you can end up in a problem. So. Uh, going wild with discounts or just letting the stacking just keep going to the moon is, is not wise. It is, I, I think in some ways, it may feel good. I'll just say this, it feels good because it's like we're giving to people. But I think it's an ethical failing because I'm not tending the resources of the community in the most effective way for the most long-term benefit to most people. And I think that's a problem. So I would actually say it, you know, the, the Jubilee sensation is a bad idea. Anyway. Just food for thought for you because you do need to think about how your program interacts with your other existing programs. Are you excluding people from something they otherwise want to participate? Are you, are you including people? And, and are you doing each of those with a rationale that makes sense and is consistent with your brand, your mission, your ends, your cooperative identity? That's an important question to ask. Oh, there's another one. So I can get to the question part. This is the wow. So it rhymes with how. <laughs> I was about to the extent of that, but the idea is that <laughs> that is my take, uh, but you have to be sensible about it. And you can generate a stronger co-op with better bottom lines, do it well, and, and have, have the kind of thing we want, which is real impact. Yeah? That's my take, my spiel. Okay. Now, this is the part where I say thank you, but we've got plenty of time for questions and stuff, but I'm going I'm to draw it out. First, go co-op, and I am so appreciative really of what you're doing to build food co-ops because uh, I, I, I've seen, seen enough real world data and research and, and seen to know that what you're doing matters and there may be days you say, boy, are we crazy? This is a lot of work. Um, work you're doing to start up food co-ops. This is one of, one of the many things we, we, I think we should be doing to try to ensure we even have a future because right now that's probably questionable, honestly. Long range, some stuff doesn't look good. But it's work like this I think gives me a little bit of a, of a semblance of hope, so I appreciate you. I think co-ops are pretty awesome. Um, and you can contact me, and there's all kinds of ways to do that. Um, got the email, everything else you want, a card, we'll get you a card. I really believe in principle six, so I love to share what we're doing, hear what you're doing. I think we make each other stronger and better by, by that kind of communication. So in the spirit of communication, it gives us about 20 minutes, so 25 minutes to talk. You can contact now. Okay. And, but, you know, I'm trying to learn about co -op. So I'm really hoping that my general manager, that they, um, this year they say, okay, this is kind of the standard of how you do food for all, in my economic plan. Mm -hmm. And I would think there would be some standards, at least as starting points, that, you know, are viable options for how it's done. I mean, from anything from here, just accepting SNAP. Yeah. 
middle of the road to here. Is, would that be the case with when you're the general manager of a grocery store or co op grocery? Yeah, there, there is a little bit of a distribution curve of approaches, but there are some things that seem to be most common, most attractive. One, uh, in terms of um, uh, access to program, it's, it's generally uh, that there is some kind of defined, at least self-identification of, you know, extraordinary economic distress. That may be identified by food assistance, it may be something that people just check the box. But that's something that is very clearly in there. It's rare, but it does happen. People will say, well, it's you know, a member of the fire department gets it every day. I heard someone had a discount for a business close by. I'm like, what? Why is it? What? Like, these are people with six-figure incomes. I don't know. To me, that's just, I don't want to cast aspersions. I'll just say, I think it should be on a mission. Second is the amount. Now, 10% um, is, is generally recognized as safe. And if, if you look at, uh, there's, there's no one that's had a huge bite taken out of them by going there. That doesn't mean, oh, it's safe, we'll give 10% to everyone. No. Uh, with this kind of program, with some reasonable parameters, that is effective. And it is enough to get people's attention. It's enough to close the gap, substantially enough that you will get activity. You're probably going to get anywhere from 3 to 5% of your total you know, shopper participation from a program like that, based on what I've seen. Now, if you go 15, I've had upwards of... 7%, so you can get between 5 and 8. You can get a lot of people. 15 is more attractive. The reason is, um, for a lot of the foods we have, it's not always the case, but in general, most of the things we have, that's enough where now the conventional counterparts that are out there, or even in our own store, start to say that some of the choices where we trade up, so we want to better nourish ourselves or our family, that's, that's where you start to get some parity in a lot of, in a lot of cases. So that's why I like that. Price. That's what I've generally gone with myself, uh, but we, we start at 10 if, if we're nervous. <laughs> right. and, and, and plus, you may be in an in a environment, if you're starting up in a certain uh, community, where uh, you have a much higher proportion of potential participants. That would give you caution about how high you go. And there's also the case that some of your co-ops are a different format. So if I'm doing conventional uh, mix or a hybrid store or something, I've got to be mindful about that as well. Uh, so I, I, might, I might try to rely on uh, some of the other kind of programs and, and say the lower percent's fine because your margins are going to be lower. So this is another consideration where I would say, in general, most of these are real full bore natural food co-ops. I think in general, you know, you could start at 10, but only 15 is the place where you start to say there's a, there's a, there's a greater sense of justice and equity there because that, that gap is closed so substantially. But 10 is safer, especially if you have more exposure to potential downside. There are people that have done this kind of thing. Uh, it, it's much less common again, but even uh, during, during the pandemic, I'll give you an example that's just, it's COVID specific kind of, but there were folks who really were vulnerable who did not have great transportation. So we have volunteers uh, that we organized, and that was a, it was a way we're organizing members or owners, whatever your persuasion is, member owners, owner members, you can call them whatever, as long as, as, long as you're clear. But uh, they would come in on certain days and they would, take the groceries to those folks and safely transfer those. And so we, we did that and, and just, you know, they did that on a volunteer basis. We didn't add any upcharge. So people who had that kind of thing, if they're homebound or are lacking transport or just they're especially vulnerable, we try to make that possible. That kind of model could happen. Now, if you're just relying on volunteer, that's not necessarily a problem. Um, you know, as long as you're not doing things that violate the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1964, you're probably in the clear. The manager will understand, hopefully, how to do that. Uh, it's important that they know not to violate that, but uh, this, this could be one of the ways that you build a, a, an opportunity for participation and coming together. And I think if your store is not organized around just 
working members and it's a closed shop like Park Slope, then you think if people aren't stocking the shelves and stuff, how do they participate? This can be a pathway. And I think it's a good one. They need to be on public transit line too. There's this too. I mean, even to the point when I was in Lexington, they didn't have the bus come by. So I um, drew, drew up my own bus line and you know, went and lobbied for it and got them to do it as a pilot. And they said, we'll do it. And then they came back uh, at the end of the pilot and said, it's our most successful route. I'm like, well, very good. <laughs> and so then I want to make it better. So I designed a bus stop. And I worked with people and I got uh, artists to do this crazy thing. And they said, that's the best engineered stock we have. I said, man, I'm in the wrong line of business. But sometimes you, you just have to push. You have to figure out how do we build. In Chicago, we don't have a real problem because we've got the train every four minutes and buses come and go. We've got an easy, honestly. We, we, we're lucky. That, that site, well, lucky, I would say we just had a visionary board that picked a great site. I'll take credit for that, but uh, I didn't do any of it. <laughs> but anyhow. Um, if you don't have, it, everybody's going to be different. This is one of those places where if you're urban, rural, maybe you've had a different kind of city council or investment. I don't know, but I will say um, that's the kind of thing you should be active. You know, that's a place where you can activate member volunteers to help too. Managers can't do it all, but uh, you can be, be active in helping solve those broader systemic problems. And there's nothing wrong with trying to make sure the co-op is a part of that conversation. I had you and then I've got two people. Can you talk about some of the specific ways you've incorporated your interest in, in fair trade and those principles in, in your co-op? Sure. Well, as far as, uh, oh yeah, thank you. So that's in how we incorporate fair trade principles in co-op. One of the things is, for us, there's certain types of commodities where we know there's extreme exploitation, so we're going to go exclusive. Like when we have a coffee bar, and this has been the case of everywhere I've managed, it's always fair trade coffee, period. We don't sell the other. And even on the shelf, that's it. Mount Hay going to make an exception because I don't have any good alternative for the instant coffee. I know that somebody drinks that. <laughs> but that's, that's one way is by making a commitment on some categories that are particularly exploited, frankly, in the global south. Uh, another is, um, you know, we're, even speaking with Bohr about saying, do you want to have a governance, you know, include that in your governance as a, as a indicator maybe. So someone will report on it. I mean, I think you manage what you measure. Uh, whether your manager says this is part of how I'm reporting or whether or not the board provides guidance where there's a dialogue. I think it should be the kind of thing that someone has an idea how you're doing. If you measure it, at least you're more likely to do something. And I also think uh, just as a, you know, costs are going to be different. But again, I think it, it's the kind of thing that should be part of both a marketing plan, the kind of thing where you reach out to a fair trade organization, you reach out to vendors who are doing how do we get this story out? I've gone so far as to have farmers come in from Central America and talk at our annual meeting. Uh, whatever it takes, get the story out. It, you know, it should be part of who you are because most of us are predicated upon smallholder co-ops around the world. That's principle six. And you're not going to get local bananas. So, you know, try to work with those programs as much as you can. But the way we do it is by, by considering it as an important thing to try to um, optimize and store and get as much as we can and we track it and we try to have continuous improvement on the kind of volume we have and the kind of percentage of goods we have. And so that's one of those things that we just include as a key metric. Yeah? So I had, I think, this table. Yes?
making sure 100% of your employee population not only treats them, takes them to the product, shows them what that product is, explains it in the same way as you do your, you know, your quote unquote kind of, for lack of better words, the, the high value customer that's placing a case for a bottle of water every week, but also when you do get to the register. Having a DBT card is not exciting, so it's not like, yes, I know how to do this, but it's also not a thing of, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna clog the system. So making sure that not only are all employees trained, management is trained, and there's also a communal code for when you come in and a customer says, they treated me differently because I did have this card, because my number was different, or kind of those different things, because you can have all the programs, but if people don't feel welcome, if you do all the networking, if you speak to your food pantry, say, hey, come to my co-op, when you go in there, I don't feel like you actually want me there, or I feel like I'm a burden, the program doesn't work. So I know it wasn't listed, but especially as a startup, that needs to be in your employee handbook. When you talk about respect, when you talk about integrity, you're actually talking about your brand reputation, your co-op identity is to treat everybody the same no matter of anything in their economic status, including the employees. Employees will be using these same programs just as everybody else. So look internally. You don't know who doesn't have food. You don't know who doesn't have money. We'd love to think you can get rich working at a grocery store. I haven't seen it. <laughs> no, I think that is fantastic, and, and you're right on. I mean, that's, you know, you can have all the stuff you want, but if you're repulsive to people, that's it. That, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and this is something, again, where I think you reflect on your identity is important. Because ultimately, co-ops come down, you boil it all down, there's, I think there's two major things, really. And, and one of them we talk about that was typical economic, the other is that sense of elevating and honoring human dignity. And if, if somebody is getting a lot of hassle for trying to access a program or because maybe they're in a different situation than someone, that's a problem. And I would say if we violate either of those two pillars, we're not just wrong, that's devastating wrong. So everything you said, uh, I hope everyone took notes on that. That's, that's uh, absolutely right. Hey, um, we're neighbors, so Wild Onion in Chicago. So you know a little bit more about our project. Yeah, I do. But we are like running fast and furiously toward general manager hiring and, and we're hoping to launch this year. So we want to launch with programs like this. And we're thinking about that operational matrix of what does the board decide, what does the GM decide, and how do you like create a framework for those decisions happening quickly? <laughs> oh, that's a spicy one. Well, I, you know, the, the, the real deal is the board is a plenty potentiary body, so they decide how to decide. I and mean, that's up to you. You can pretty much, you, you're in charge. But I think um, over time, I, 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 I think people try different approaches. I think uh, probably the, the clearest thing I've seen and the thing I've, I've worked under different systems, I still think policy governance is aggravating as it is, and some people go on about double A's, it's still properly done, provides guidance, clarity, and accountability in a way that other systems don't. Now, there's no system that's a fix-all, so uh, the right people doing the right things can overcome a, 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 a system that has defects, but people are you know, maybe you want to do the wrong things or whatever, even a good system does not prevent that. So there's still going to be an amount of diligence and things like that. But I would just say, I'm a fan of the policy governance. I'd be happy to show you resources for that. It's not the only way to do it. I mean, the fair trade, our board does not use it. It's, it's, it depends on your circumstance. But I think that's helpful uh, with, with in, in the style of organizations we have. So I think that's one tool. Uh, but the biggest thing is, you, it depends on when you, you hire. If you hire someone, and say, all right, you're hired a month before opening, there is no way they're going to be able to get to touch this, so you're going to have to have done it, which means you know, try to hire them earlier or get dialogue with someone or bring them in part-time or something. Uh, that would be helpful. Or, as, a, as an aside, you could link with other co-ops doing the same work or try to get, you know, at least get a core recipe and say, here is a default thing. Figure out if you believe there's some need to change it, but at least you've got a base to work from. So I think it's helpful as a, as a manager when you come into something if you're not starting with absolute scratch, sure. as long as you can, can work with it. So I'd say at least seek out those kind of baseline problems. Find co-ops that are doing work that looks like the kind of work you want to see done and, and get their materials and have that at the ready for someone so they have a head start. Because if it's just like, we've decided that's your deal, 
That may be a really tough draw. I've, I've discovered though, and I've done this a long time, I've done just about everything I can think of in the food co-ops, startups are hard and it's disorienting. I mean, I'm just like, wow, it's a whole different reality. So uh, when you can have stuff like that at the ready, it, it will make a difference, I assure you. And if you need uh, your neighbors, we can talk more about it. <laughs> hey, Sam, what you got? Uh, so one of the things I wanted to mention was thinking about folks who have these programs. So in the New England area, there's a very strong active use of food for all programs. And there's a group called the Neighboring Food Co-op Association. Mm -hmm. um, Body Husband and, and other folks working there. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a group called uh, Hungry Free Vermont that has done a ton of research and a lot of lobbying work. So if you're looking for models and if you're looking for something to tweak and adjust. Uh, folks in that region have a lot of connection, a lot of things they've done already, so that don't recreate the wheel, you know, find friends and neighbors. Um, this New England area seems to be doing a lot of work on this. What was the second one I saw? Hunger Free Vermont. Thank you. Yeah, they do a lot of lobbying work, that double down bucks or whatever your state calls it, you know, there's a lot of that work happening. Yeah. Double down, that sounds like something Texas would pull. That's, a, <laughs> that's got a certain feel to it. But, uh, and, and I'm going to put you on the spot a little because you, you guys are getting a little further along. Uh, have you settled on some program parameters, whatnot, that you can share with this group? Yeah. Because you're yeah. going through this process right now. Yeah, we are. So, and I think to that question of how the board and I interact. So, I'm the general manager at Aspen Co op Market. My name is Sam McCormick. Um, and the, the board, and in our conversation, the board sets the ends, right? It sets the mission, it sets the goals. We, have worked on updating those together. Um, and with the emphasis on, on making sure that DEI work and equity work is built into our practices. So it sets up my operational goals, right? It sets up when I need to report to the board. And, and then conversation about how does that fit in our financial modeling, which is my job, right? Mm -hmm. And so we are being a little conservative and we're looking at 10%. And we're looking at funding a loan fund that covers 175 over $200 equity. So we're seeking out grants to fund this initially. Um, and we have a uh, fiscal sponsor set up so we can do that. Uh, we're currently seeking about uh, $200,000 to fund this for, for a couple of years. And that's with an estimate, right? Because so much of this is estimated. The estimated number of people that will utilize the program. So I can estimate that $500,000 in discounts will be used to register in two years, or that could happen in a quarter, right? You don't know how actively you like the program will be in the universe. And we don't know how the economy is going to go. There might be a lot more people eligible for your program, okay. you know, depending. I, I can say this from, like I say, my experience of the last um, big scale program um, uh, that I was part of, Ron, we had 0.8% uh, of sales going to this. We had heavy usage, but that was good because I could show you how the economics work, but for us, pushing that was okay. For some of you, that might be a problem, but uh, we, we had a certain scale where that didn't matter so much and we were getting a ton of incremental gain. But, uh, but anyway, uh, don't expect it's gonna be a tenth of a percent of sales or something. I'd say at least somewhere around a half a percent, that's, that's where it's gonna go when you open one of these. And, and if you're getting heavy usage, you can get up into that 0.8 or 0.9. It's entirely possible. Does that work? Well, your manager should be able to answer that question with you. Uh, and, you know, press on um, you know, grill them a little bit, because it's important. I like getting grilled, it gives us a chance to talk about what we're doing, so I'm gonna sizzle away, I got some in here, they'll, they'll sizzle me on this before it's over. All right, what else we got, Tori's question and comment? I got Dave, and I'm gonna go with you, J.D. Well, I think implicit in a lot of this, uh, somewhat explicitly, somewhere somebody's gotta be doing the math and the arithmetic, right, so it makes sense. At whatever level of reporting and accountability, somebody's gotta be doing that so they understand the impact of these programs. And uh, that'll be the meeting of the co-op as association and the co-op as business is where this actually pencils out. And if you're not doing that, he's illustrated there can be real problems. And I just wanna to add to that that this also applies to the question of volunteers with discount versus paid labor. You have a lot of the same issues. You'd like to involve people, but at a certain point the cost isn't worth it, depending on how much you're discounting for so-called volunteers, and paid labor can be a lot more effective and efficient. Mm -hmm. That's true, and this is another one of those things when you have like a, if you have an owner volunteer program because of discount, does that stack with this? Are you saying, oh, well, you're not, these are the kind of considerations that get a little bit thornier 
with the, with the stacking. But uh, you're right. I think in general, paid labor is paid because we're generating efficiencies. And I, I even, I'll just, I'm not going to get too deep into it, but like even with Park Slope, pretty extreme model. I penciled out the, the, the amount, if I look at the margin, I say really what they were doing, the savings to just offset the labor pretty much directly. But it takes a... You, well, you so they've got 30 well-paid coordinators. <laughs> exactly. And that that kind of makes it makes it go. But it's it's sort of like the, the effort and the resources coming from somewhere. And, and that case is interesting because it came right back to toward me. People may not know parts. Oh, I'm sorry. They're up in Brooklyn. Uh, it's, a, it's a closed shop that requires... Uh, regular labor from members, so they, they have a small staff that's necessary to keep certain things going, but everybody is bagging figs and Sanjo. And I, even to the point when I went up, uh, kind of recruited Joe and, and them to get into NCG. Uh, just on, as to what I did with vacation time, so that's how it's been vacation. <laughs> so I go in and I'm talking about stuff and, and analyzing the biz of them, trying to learn. And we had a great time, and they were like, Wow, you kind of told us we were being jerks about a couple of things. But that's good because no one said that to us and we're going to rethink stuff. I said, awesome. So they made me a pecan pie. And then I went down to buy a tote bag because I am a cereal tote bag collector. And I got by my wife's like, what are you doing? Just got this 100 of these co-op bags. And please get rid of them. And so I'm like, I got to have the park slope bag. So I get us a drum of the bag. He said, you can. I said, why? He said, you're not a working member. They wouldn't let me buy the bag. I said, I don't have it. Anyway, so they're, they're an interesting case of cooperation, very powerful case. Uh, but they, they do have a different model that probably doesn't translate to everybody. JD, we'll get you and then we're going to go because we're getting on time. Just a quick question. Um, our, I, I'm with the Oshkosh Food Club here in Wisconsin. We're about to launch our food for all program. One of the areas and topics of the discussion this past week with the board is the language that we're using for it. And I'm trying to encourage them to do a softer approach. Obviously, um, this targeted area that we're working with. Um, they're all dealing with uh, their own internal issues. I don't want it, that comfort level to be on fine with them. Do you have examples of like what you're doing, the, the verbiage that you're actually using for your printed materials and stuff that would be beneficial to help with something like that? We can get you some 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 examples from different coasts. We don't have a ton of that made just yet because the program still hasn't coalesced. I mean, I've got a pretty good idea of what I'm, I'm seeing. Sure. Still got some outreach to do to make sure that the community will agree. And then I'll say, well, board here, we've solved your problem. And, and they may say, no, you haven't. And we'll go back and refine it, but we'll see. Uh, but you're talking about just like the, the framing of like food for all versus community discount program, et cetera. Yeah, and, and making sure that, and, and I can kind of show you the examples of ours and what, what the first couple of drafts have been. But it, the tone in it, um, to me, has been a little harsh. And we're just looking for different opportunities well, I would say there's no one right answer. Every every community is going to be a little different, and anything you pick, everything has uh, you know pros and cons. So there'll be something to, to pick at if you want to pick at it. But the question is, is, is it getting the, the the best message across to most people? And I'd be happy to look at that with you. But you can see that there's a lot of folks that uh, use food for all. Part of that's because food for all started early. Now sometimes I think boy, is it really food for all? Because if someone can't afford to buy anything at all, it's not. So I'm a little hesitant about that terminology because I know there's going to be some folks who are going to have to be helping through our commitments to the food banks and shelters and, and some other things. Um, so I don't know, but it's still, it's, it's catchy. And you say something like, I've used uh, this a couple of times, community discount program. But there's a discount program that's available to the community if I meet criteria. So it was clear in that way but it sounds really cold but it worked in practice and it and we got a huge response in california a huge response to seattle i just depends on, on, the, on the community you're dealing with and we, we can talk but yeah that's something you should reach out to the co-ops that are most similar to what you're trying to be and, and see what they're doing and that'll give you a shortcut because they picked it for a reason and then you can ask them are you actually happy with it does the community like it or are you just stuck with it and that's a question you should ask anyway I know we are at two minutes over, and I don't want to be the guy holding the room and the other presenters cussing me. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you